I, I want to help out England. I didn't bust my enough. <laughs> I didn't bust my nut enough in England. Oh, I still didn't do enough. Stevenson was like, well, you know, I, 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 there is other stuff you can do. So Dahl was hired into a dark propaganda section referred to as the BSC, which stands for the British Security Council. Hello. Today we're going to talk about Edgar Allan Poe and his rivalry with Rufus Griswold, one of America's first pieces of Okay, this is the 1800s and no one has any money. Like people are like sweeping the streets and maybe you'd find like a crust of bacon and you'd eat it. Edgar Allan Poe is one of the great American poets, completely disrespected by everyone he ever came in contact with. He was always broke and he came into contact with a fellow by the name of Rufus Griswold. So Griswold says to Poe, hey, I'm making this book called The Poets and Poetry of America. So give me some of your poems, and uh, if I like them, I'll put them in. He knows if he puts him in the book, then Edgar Allan Poe will be likely to write a nice review. So Poe's like, okay, I'll give you some of my poems. So here's my poems. So. Books get, book get, the book gets published. Poe's, three of po, Poe's poems are, are printed. Griswold has printed 50 poems by one of his friends. 50! Poe's sitting there with a book in front of him, flipping through the book, flip, 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 flip. What the f Are you f serious? This f sucker, hack, loser, ass has put me in the very back of this book. I have been hornswoggled by a <laughs> Griswold comes to him. He's like, Edgar, what do you say that you write one of your wonderful reviews of my book? And uh, I'll give you uh, $100 for it. It's basically bribery. And Poe's like, sure, no problem. I'll take your money and write a review of this, this book. No problem. No <laughs> problem. Rufus. <laughs> so, so, he, so he writes the review. Now Griswold has been telling his friends, you know, Poe's gonna write this great review of my <laughs> Then he, when, when he reads the review that he paid for, like, no one should read this, none of these poets are gonna be remembered except for me. It's a waste of time to even look at this thing. All this is crap. Hey, Ground Poe. He's like, really? I gave you money to write a review of a book of poetry that I put you in. You ass game on. So Poe starts hearing that Griswold is now like, is talking about him. So he goes on a tour of America and being like, hey, what's up guys? You guys know about Rufus Griswold, right? The guy who wrote this book of poetry where he only put three of my poems in. You know about this guy? He's like a hack, just like a stereotypical basic bull ass. He has no talent at all. And if you give Griswold a hand job, he'll put 20 poems in his book. He is a vile, holographic piece of Holograms don't even exist yet, and I'm calling him a hologram. Very important note, the anthology, despite Poe talking all this is massively successful. Poe goes to his job at this magazine and seated at his desk is Rufus Griswold, who's like, oh, I'm sorry. While you were gone, I got your job. And uh, I'm getting paid more than you got paid. So I win. Good night. So Bo's like, what the f He's like, what the f His worst enemy has taken his job. And he's f***ed. He's f***ed. He goes on drinking binges. He's a drunk. He's a drunk. He's a lunatic. He's like wandering the streets. And right around that time, his wife dies. And um, Poe goes insane and starts taking laudanum, which is this like downer, but it makes you high as a kite. And that's it, man. Poe continues to spiral down into an ob uh, oblivion. They find him laying in a gutter in Baltimore. They take him to a hospital where he dies. So, Poe's dead. Griswold wanted Poe to seem like a monster. So, 
fucking Griswold proceeds to write these scathing biographies of Edgar Allan Poe. He was a drunk. He was always in debt. He sucked. He was awful. Forget about him. Forget about him. But everyone in America read this and they're like, wait, what? Drunk, crazy guy who wrote about ravens? Where can I get this book? That sounds awesome. It ended up making Edgar Allan Poe 50,000 times more famous, and he's considered to be one of the great writers of our time. L later in his life, Griswold comes down with tuberculosis and dies alone with a picture of Edgar Allan Poe on the wall, watching him think, look at you, man. Where are you now? Look at Griswold, all you people out there. I don't care what you do. What'd you do? Guess what? No one's gonna remember it. Your, your silly attempt to disguise a f history show and like people getting drunk, it's failure, no one cares. No one's buying it, man. Forget it, we're all getting sucked into the void. Ugh. Uh, my name is Lucius Dillon. Today we're gonna talk about Roald Dahl his life as a British spy. World War II, Roald Dahl was a fighter pilot for the RAF, uh, the Royal Air Force. And he loved fighting them Nazis. And he's like, oh, this is great. And so he had to go and fly to a base in the desert. He ran out of gas, hit the ground at 75 miles an hour, cracked his skull. He had to drag himself out of the plane before the gas tanks exploded. So he pretty much was like invalided out of the uh, Royal Air Force. But then a famous author, C.S. Forrester, wanted to interview him about his crash. Dahl was like, okay, you know what? My mind's a little spotty. Let me just, let me just write down some notes for you. Forrester's like, okay, send them to me later. So Dahl sat down to kind of write it and his mind was kind of muddled because he went through a crash, but he wrote like a really good story. Sent it to Forrester and Forrester wrote back. It's like, okay, look, you're, <laughs> You're supposed to give me notes, not write a full f***ing story. <laughs> this, this is great. This is amazing. I, I'm not changing a word. I'm sending this straight to the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, so that got sent, and it was actually really popular. And he realized, like, okay, I can tear a pretty good yarn, or I don't know if that's the right term, but <laughs> I can, I can write a pretty good story. See? You gotta tickle it. You gotta know. <laughs> Let's keep going. Uh, yeah, he was the talk of the town. And so he was invited to a lot of these parties. He met up with a really cool guy called Bill Stevenson. And Bill Stevenson is just like, hey, what, uh, what's going on with you? Uh, Dolls is like, I, I want to help out England. I didn't bust my nuff. <laughs> I didn't bust my nut enough in England. Oh, I still didn't do enough. Stevenson was like, well, no, I. I there is other stuff you can do. So Dahl was hired into a dark propaganda section referred to as the BSC, which stands for the British Security Council. A lot of other people were hired. Noel Coward, who was a famous playwright and actor, and also Ian Fleming, who some people might know as James motherfucking Bond. Stevenson was like, let's put you into some good political parties and meet everyone you can and report everything back to us. He's like, okay. So here's Rawl f***ing doll, tall, handsome motherfucker, long ass face, eloquent ass tongue. But every time when he was at the party, like he'd be eavesdropping on newspaper people, politicians, and then secretly just like scribbling, you know, little things on like napkins and reporting it to England. He would also get into finding information through pillow talk. He had a list of ladies that he would go through. Like, Sissy Patterson had her claws into the Washington Herald Times. And she's like, you want to see the bourgeois? And he's like, yes, please. So he f the shit out of her for a while and got whatever information that he could. Then he went to uh, Evelyn McLean. She knew every politician in the world, so they f a lot. So he met Claire Booth Luce. She was a congresswoman, and they uh, f <laughs> and he, he got so much information through so much of his dick. But after a while, and this is an exact quote, like he called uh, Ambassador Halifax and was like, look, I am f***ed out, okay? This goddamn woman has f***ed me from one end of the room to the other, I'm done. I can't do it. I am squirting dust. And Ambassador's like, just close your eyes and think of England. And I was like, great, okay, I guess I will. 
Get your chin off my dis- neck. Oh, oh. No, it's... Your chin off my neck. No, that wasn't... I, my chin wasn't on you at all. I feel like we're laying on two Muppets. <laughs> yes. <coughs> oh, Jesus. Is this your death scene? <laughs> if you die on the show, we're f- Okay, so FDR was in his third term. Britain was like, okay, he's getting old. We are worried that he's gonna die because he's our biggest supporter right now. You need to let us know everything that's wrong with him. And he's like, yeah, I'll be right over. Uh, and now, I'm here right now. And so luckily, Eleanor Roosevelt was like, hey, I'm a big fan of yours, so be my husband. <laughs> And he's like, oh, yeah, nice to meet you, FDR. Nice to meet you, too, Roald Dahl. And they have uh, a lovely time. They drink a lot. So he took note of everything, wrote it all in a 12-page document, and it worked out very well uh, until FDR died. And then the war ended, and Dahl's life as a spy was over. He was like, what can I do now? He's like, well, I need to make a buck, so let me just go for the easy money and just I'll just write some interpolous novels, that'll be great. So he wrote James and the Giant Peach, which was amazing. And then in the same year, he wrote Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which holy sh was the best. He wrote Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, wrote The Witches, wrote the BFG, wrote Fantastic Mr. Fox. He's hands down f Dr. Seuss, the greatest children's author of all time. And he was a fing spy, literally a spy and because of his dick England was a better place I enjoy day drinking I enjoy drinking with you Jay drinking I enjoy day drinking and you're continuing hello I'm Allison Rich and today we will be talking about Agatha Christie <laughs> okay. okay our story begins in England it's 9.45 p.m., December 3rd, 1926. Famed mystery writer, Agatha Christie, she's kind of like the Stephen King of the 1920s, packed a small suitcase, walks out of her house, and she disappears. Dun, dun, dun. Mystery. Um, so the next day, a gypsy boy named George Best is walking along and then he comes to the bottom of a hill and he's like, whoa, what's this car doing here? Cars don't, aren't at the bottom of hills. And the car has the hood popped and a door is open and the lights are on. So he calls the police. The police come and Deputy Chief Constable William Kenward was like, you know what? I'm on the case and I am gonna search the shit out of this. <laughs> and he looks inside and there's um, an expired license and a piece of paper and they say, Agatha? Christy. It's called vocal fry. So. <laughs> oh, okay. So he's like, oh my God, there's been a mystery with our own mystery writer. So then William Kenward is like, I'm gonna get scouts, I'm gonna get bloodhounds, I'm gonna get divers, I'm gonna get planes. We've never used planes before to search for someone, but you know what, I'm gonna fucking do it. Wow. They fucking were searching like to the max, but no dice, they don't find her shit. So Kenwood's like, okay, what I'm gonna do is we're in the middle of a mystery, I'm gonna get two mystery writers to help find her. So he employs the help of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, AKA the writer of Sherlock Holmes, and then this lady, Dorothy L. Sayers, who we don't know. <laughs> but then somebody comes in and they're like, <gasps> record scratch, oh what? Don't worry about it, we found Agatha. <laughs> so 11 days after she disappeared, people are waiting, being like, what happened to famed mystery writer Agatha Christie, where did she go? And she's like, I don't know, I can't, I can't help you. The police are like, what? Really disappointing, we were all searching for her, but she's just here. Um, so the police were left to just like piece together what had happened over those 11 days. So flashback. Okay, at the time, December 3rd, 1926, um, Agatha is having a tough time. Okay, she's 36 and life is punching her in the tits, okay? Like, her marriage is on the rocks, and her husband, Archie, is being a dick about it. He was like, I want to marry my secretary, but I'm already married. Ugh, this wife of mine. <laughs> 
So, she starts to exhibit the signs of a nervous breakdown. And Archie's like, hey, I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna leave you for my secretary because I like her better than you. And she's like, wow, really cool. So she's like, you know what? I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna drive to London. So she starts driving to London, bash, bam! Car accident, she gets into a car accident. So, 24 hours later, very mysteriously, she arrives at this spa and hotel called the Swan Hydropathic in Harrogate, 230 miles from where she had been. She checks in and she's like, hey, look at me. I'm wearing glasses. I wasn't wearing glasses before and I have a different hairstyle. What? Did she stage her own disappearance? Or did she have a mental break, Whoa. right? And she's like, my name is Teresa Neely. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. I just lost a child. Please lay off my back. I'm trying to recuperate. Um, that's all there is to it. <laughs> and the hotel people are like, okay, too much information. And then she's like, you know what? I'm gonna have a great time. I'm gonna like live it up. She gets some beauty treatments. She goes dancing. Chilling out, Max, and relaxing, all cool. <laughs> and she's reading her own story. Like, ooh, what's going on in the news? This is interesting. The weather's gonna be 78, and there's a lady who's missing in Agatha, Christy. <laughs> so. Be careful with that drink. It's fine, Derek. <laughs> so. Meanwhile, a chambermaid is like, wait, um, aren't you her? Aren't you this person? And she's just like, I don't know what you're saying. So the police- It's really bothering me. I'm oh, so drink. afraid that no, that's no, no. gonna fall. Okay, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> the police, they didn't know what to make of it. They were like, this is a publicity stunt for her new book, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. And some of them are like, this is her trying to get back at her husband. And others are like, she was in a car crash, so she had amnesia. Uh, but so Agatha's like, I don't know, you know what? But what I do know is I have a new attitude. I'm gonna divorce my husband, and I'm gonna go on to write 80 novels, and 66 are gonna be mystery novels. And I'm gonna be such a best-selling author that the only person who beats me, or literature that beats me is the Bible and Shakespeare. And that is exactly what she did. She was a huge success. She never speaks of the event again. Oh, P.S. I forgot to say that at one point, Agatha said to her sister, I can disappear at any point if I wanted to. I would know how to do it. I would know all the stuff because I know mysteries. So if I disappear, maybe I know how to do it. <laughs> okay, great. I feel like I could say my I'm Allison Rich now better. You do, that? do you want me to say that? Yeah. <sighs> Hello. <laughs> I'm Allison Rich. <laughs> oh no!